Good morning, everyone. I'm Nolan Goldberg. I'm Senior Counsel Intellectual Property and Technology at the Proskauer Law Firm. Now, I follow big data not only because I study the impact of emerging technologies on the law, uh, which is part of my practice, but also because I think this particular technology has a couple of things about it that are very interesting and possibly transformative for my profession. So for e-discovery, I'm always looking for new ways to manage ever larger piles of documents to try to glean some meaning from them for my clients. But at the same time, I want to avoid the cost and inherent inaccuracy of having to go uh, page by page through uh, millions and eventually billions of pages of documents. Uh, and so the new filtering technologies that are coming out of big data and data visualization technology, uh, it's incredibly important. But perhaps, I think, more transformative is what's coming next. So part of my practice is looking at what's happened before uh, cases and trying to make predictions for my clients about how courts are likely to deal with similar or slightly different situations in the future so that we can assess risk. Now, over the past few years, what we've seen is more and more courts dockets have come online, gone electronic. And so every day, I'm bombarded with more and more data faster and faster uh, from all these courthouses throughout the country and in certain cases the world. And as we build analytics on top of this data stack, what I think you're going to see uh, is that I'm going to be able to make predictions of what's going to happen next with much greater accuracy uh, than ever before. And I think that's going to be an incredibly powerful thing uh, as it happens. And it's, again, it's already happening right now. But putting uh, this aside, there are a number of legal issues with big data uh, that are also as interesting. And we'll, today, we'll focus on a couple of those. So here's our uh, roadmap for today. We're going to start by talking with some foundational uh, discussion on big data and the Constitution. Because while you and I call it data, uh, courts sometimes use a different word, and that's speech. So when dealing with regulation of big data, we're going to get into all kinds of First Amendment uh, freedom of speech issues that are going to need to be dealt with. So it's not that the government can't regulate data. Uh, we know it can, as evidenced by our incredibly burdensome privacy regime. Uh, but when it goes to regulate data, it has to do so in a permissible way. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and what that actually could mean for big data. We'll talk about the evolution of privacy, because you may not have appreciated, but privacy is not a static concept. Uh, it evolves over time, and technology uh, tends to drive the evolution of privacy. And I think big data has the potential for being incredibly disruptive in this area. Finally, the final two sections, I think, are a little more practical uh, and really all fall under the umbrella of ownership, frankly. It's ownership of the data uh, that eventually makes up a big data set. It's how we transfer the ownership of these little pieces of data as we're aggregating large big data sets, the right way to transfer the data, uh, what happens when you transfer it uh, in an improper way. It's ownership of the tools that we're going to use to manage and analyze data. And finally, ownership of the big data sets themselves and whatever analysts, uh, whatever uh, we learn from analysis of those data sets. So that's our agenda for today, and let's start with our first topic of big data and the Constitution. And what I thought we'd do is start with two slides that I think frame the issue uh, that data as a regulated product is different than other kinds of products. And so here's our first court questioning uh, that when regulating data as a product, does it need to treat it differently uh, than, for example, beef jerky? And while the Supreme Court of the United States has answered this question for us definitively, uh, data is different as a product. Whatever the challenges of applying the Constitution to ever-advancing technology, the basic principles of freedom and speech do not vary when a new and different medium for communication appears. So, at the end of the day, the fundamental data concepts are going to survive uh, as we enter this new era of big data. The court's going to apply uh, very much the same principles. Now, that doesn't mean that governments can't regulate content. Of course they can. Uh, but when they do it, they have to do it in a permissible way. And that means it has to pass what's known as the strict scrutiny test. So the government needs to be pursuing a legitimate policy, and it has to pursue it in a legitimate way. So let's, I thought we'd talk about two example cases, one that survived strict scrutiny and one that didn't, uh, to see what lessons we could learn for the potential regulation of big data. So the first case is a Sorrell case, and this is actually a case decided by the Supreme Court of the United States earlier this year. And the statute at issue in this case uh, was the Vermont government's effort uh, to regulate the use and sale of prescription drug information. 
So Vermont claimed it had a, a policy interest in protecting the privacy of healthcare records. And to do this, it created a statute that prevented uh, people from aggregating, buying and selling, and using uh, records related to prescription drugs. But it didn't regulate the use of all kinds of activity, only activity related to brand name drugs. It expressly exempted the use of prescription data uh, to market and target generic drugs. And what the court said was, this is inappropriate. If your concern was really the privacy of healthcare records, you'd want to ban all use of these records, or at least most use. And in fact, what they had done is only carved out a small use as prohibited. And what the court said was, there's a second policy in play here, and that was the Vermont government's policy in favor of generic drugs. And that wasn't a legitimate policy. So the lesson here is while we can regulate data, we have to do it in a content-neutral manner. Uh, we can't engage in content-based discrimination or use regulation uh, to advance one side of a debate over another. Now, so here's the general rule, and it's that data should flow free. That's the general case, unless the strict scrutiny test is passed. So that when faced with the choice between the dangers of suppressing information and the danger of misuse of freely available, it's one the First Amendment makes for us. Data should flow free. So now we'll talk about our second case. And this case involved a statute designed to prevent the republication of social security numbers. And now what's particularly interesting about the conduct at issue in this case is that it actually went right to the heart of the First Amendment. It was for protest. The government was supposed to redact social security numbers from public records before it made those records available, and it hadn't been doing so. So a citizen went to the records, took a few numbers of prominent government officials that were still in the records, and put it on the website. And so, of course, the government didn't like this. But the court noted there's a vast difference between public records that can be found after a diligent search of files and a computerized summary located in a single clearinghouse of information. So to the extent data may be public um, but difficult to get to, it's not going to be treated the same as by the courts as data that's much more easily accessible. And this is very important for big data because what we're seeing is lots of data that may have always been out there uh, is now becoming very easy for us to access. And so privacy rights can survive publication. Just because we're doing a big data analysis on public data, it doesn't mean the individuals no longer have any privacy interest in that data. And in fact, if the repeated disclosure of public data creates new opportunities for harm, uh, there may be lasting privacy interests in that data that will need to be dealt with. So our next topic, the evolution of privacy. And we'll talk about two different kinds of privacy here. One, constitutional privacy under the Fourth Amendment, which prevents against uh, government search and seizure. And two, statutory privacy. And I think what you'll see is that big data uh, has changed both of these privacy regimes, even in the absence of any new regulation. And in some ways, uh, it's been very disruptive. So let's start with constitutional privacy. Now, constitutional privacy attaches wherever an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy. But what's reasonable changes over time. So back in the old days, we all had reasonable expectations of privacy in the contents of our backyard, and the police couldn't survey our backyard without a warrant. Well, with low-flying planes, aerial photography, satellite photography, uh, we no longer have reasonable expectations of privacy in our backyards, and so police no longer need warrants. And what we're seeing now uh, is new technology is changing our views on privacy and, in some sense, eroding constitutional privacy. And the current battleground right now is location-based services. We're all carrying tracking devices with us all the time, our cell phones, and our cell phones are all logging into various base stations, so even if the GPS uh, part is turned off, uh, our location is still being broadcast. And so what's our expectation of privacy in that information? So all of these new bells and whistles uh, and information that's being generated has become a, more of a nation of sensors uh, is going to continue to erode our expectations of privacy. Now, one of the interesting things about big data is the effect it's had on anonymization. So, uh, there was a study a long time, I guess uh, about a year ago, uh, where Netflix had published some anonymous user data, and it was determined that that information could be re-identified by cross-referencing uh, that anonymous data set with another data set. 
And so what we've seen with big data is that anonymization has started to break down. What you might not have appreciated is that the current privacy regime relies very heavy on anonymization in order to work properly. So as anonymization breaks down, uh, the carefully crafted balance in our privacy regime tends to break down as well. So for example, uh, the European Union's Data Protection Directive, a very important, uh, very broad privacy regime, protects personally identifiable information against disclosure. Well, now that anonymization breaks down, more and more information is personally identifiable. So therefore, the impact of the statute is going to become much broader. Now, beyond um, stating which information cannot flow, one of the more important functionalities of privacy regimes is telling you which information can flow. So for example, in HIPAA, we want to protect uh, personal health records. But at the same time, we also want to facilitate very important medical research. And anonymization is one of the things we use to accomplish this. Similarly, with the EU Data Protection Directive, anonymization is one of the few mechanisms uh, which allow for cross-border data flows, which are incredibly important for business. As this tool breaks down, our ability uh, to use these mechanisms breaks down as well. And that's potentially a very serious problem. Now, before you all think this is just lawyers' uh, fear, uncertainty, and distrust, this has, in fact, already started to happen. So California has a statute called the Song-Beverly Credit Card Act, which protects against the collection of personally identifiable information at the point of sale. Now, what was happening was um, companies were still asking for zip codes at the point of sale. And this is supporting all kinds of very useful demographic research. Well, one court last year decided that because a zip code can support re-identification, a zip code is PII, and it can no longer be collected. Well, this has had two very significant practical consequences. One, that useful demographic research uh, is no longer possible. And the second, this has led to uncertainty, a flurry of new lawsuits, and lots of additional expense. So it's had a very severe practical consequence. Let's talk a little bit now about populating uh, big data sets. And we'll talk really about two kinds of population. Uh, the first, automated. We'll focus on uh, web scraping. And then we'll talk a little bit about point of sale collection. And so what legal issues cover the automated collection of data uh, as we're essentially transferring ownership of information that's already been published onto the web for use in whatever analysis we're going to conduct? So we'll start uh, with a federal statute, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this provides civil and criminal penalties for accessing third-party computer systems either without authorization or by exceeding the scope of authorization. Uh, so the lesson here for the data scraper is that whatever terms of service a particular website has are really going to be important in helping to determine whether this act is going to actually apply to you. So there's some danger for the scraper in that each website is going to have its own terms of service, uh, and the scraper needs to analyze each site to determine uh, what it's permitted to do and what its risk is. Now we'll move on to a few state causes of action. Now here the risk is compounded again, because besides having to look at the contract for every single website, every state enforces these causes of action slightly differently. So in certain states, for example, some of these may not be applicable. In other states, uh, it might be much easier to make one of these causes of action. So now it's just enhanced risk for the scraper. So the first one is trespass. And much in the same way you can trespass onto land or real property, uh, you can trespass onto a server. And certain states have held that the increased traffic uh, from scraping might be damage enough to support this cause of action. Unjust enrichment, uh, misappropriation of factual data. So even where that data uh, may not be subject to copyright protection, if some investment of time and money went into collecting that data and you just take it, it might be considered unjust enrichment. And finally, breach of contract. Uh, to the extent the site's terms of service might be held to be, bi be binding on you, which again is going to vary from state to state, uh, your actions may constitute breach of damage, uh, breach of contract, and subject you to damages. So let's move in a little bit now to point of sale uh, retail collection. And we spoke earlier about the California Song Beverly Credit Card Act, which prohibits the collection of personal identifiable information at the point of sale. Now, California is very forward thinking when it comes to privacy rules. There's another important law in California, the California Shine the Light Law. Now, while this doesn't prohibit the actual collection of information, it does place a very burdensome disclosure requirements. So upon the request of a California citizen, you have to disclose what personal information you've collected, that you've shared, 
the identities of with whom that information has been shared. And it also outlines a lot of information that has to be included in your online privacy policy. Now, on the topic of privacy policies, while these may be very good uh, tools to help uh, limit liability in many cases, and in other cases they're required, if you've got a privacy policy, and if it's alleged you either haven't complied with your privacy policy or your privacy policy is somehow misleading, or you're opening yourself up to an FTC investigation, a deceptive trade practices complaint. And this has happened to a number of cloud providers uh, in the past year. Now, on the topic of the FTC, uh, I thought it's interesting to spend a little time on a document that just came out, I think, in January of this year, the Protecting Consumer Privacy in an Era of Rapid Change. Now, this is a proposed framework for how the FTC would like to change uh, its privacy enforcement regime in the, in the future. There are some political aspects here, and it's unclear whether this document will ever be adopted, uh, and if so, when. But I thought it's useful to just go through where at least the FTC sees privacy enforcement going in the future. And they've broken it down into really three components. The first component they shorthand as privacy by design. And it has several elements with which we're already familiar from the European privacy regime. Collecting data only for specific purposes, using it only for that purpose, keeping it for only as long as needed for that purpose, and then deleting promptly afterwards. And what the FTC wants people to do without a whole lot of explanation as to how this is supposed to happen is incorporate privacy into every aspect of an organization and product design. So privacy shouldn't be something that you only think about uh, as an afterthought later on, but it should be fundamental to product development. The second thing here actually in some ways uh, lessens the burden on data collection and then in other cases uh, increases the burden. What they've said is that for certain kinds of data that's customarily collected, you don't need to get in informed consent because people should expect, for example, that if you're uh, mail ordering something, you're going to have to give them your address and that you, they might use the address for certain purposes. However, where it's not uh, a, a customary thing, um, you should use what they call a just-in-time approach. So as they're asking for the data, they should have a disclosure of what it is they're asking for and why they're asking for it. And the final point, companies should increase the transparency of their data practices. Now, in some sense, this focuses on the privacy policy, making it clearer and easier to read, uh, but it may also go well beyond that, although based on this paper, it's unclear uh, in what way how that's supposed to be. But anyway, um, there, is, there was talk that this document was going to be made final later this year. I'm not sure if that's going to happen now, uh, but it's definitely something worth following. So our final topic for today, uh, ownership. Now, what you may not have realized is as you collect and aggregate these larger data sets, uh, there's a copyright interest that emerges in the compilation that's separate and apart from whatever copyright interest there might have been in the underlying data. Now, this copyright interest doesn't diminish uh, any copyright in the underlying data. It's not an excuse to infringe any underlying copyright, uh, but it's a separate copyright that will apply to the compilation, to the selection, to the arrangement, to the link structure or any navigational arrangements. Trade secret protection. A compilation of data can also be the trade secret protection. If it has ec independent economic value, is not generally known or readily ascertainable, and is subject to reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. So whereas copyright uh, could be a data set that's published, a trade secret protection could apply to a data set that's maintained in secret. Now, trade secret protection can also apply uh, to the tools that we use uh, to maintain and analyze our data or our business methodologies as well. So trade secret protection is potentially uh, broadly applicable in the big data context. Patents. Um, and we're talking here about ownership of the tools with which we're going to use to organize, maintain, and analyze our data. There's been a lot of question over the past couple of years about to what extent business methods are patentable. And those questions, to a certain extent, are still not resolved, but it's clear that just because you've got an algorithm or a formula as part of your invention, it does not make it necessarily unpatentable, which means we should be considering applying for intellectual property protection if we're developing uh, big data technology. But perhaps equally as important, uh, we should give a lot of thought to avoiding the IP of others. So what this may mean if you're developing a big data pr product is you want to understand what intellectual property uh, your competitors have already staked their claim to, or non-practicing entities who may be suing people in your space, because it's a lot easier uh, during the design phase uh, 
uh, to design around someone else's IP uh, than it is to try to design around once you've already been uh, in a lawsuit. And certainly, it's a lot cheaper. So our final topic today will be privacy. And the question is, uh, to the extent an individual provides uh, some data that's used in a big data analysis, what interests or rights uh, do they have in the results of that analysis? And we'll talk about this question with reference to a, the Maynard case, uh, both because it's a very interesting case and because it's going to be before the Supreme Court uh, just in the upcoming session. So I think we're going to get a lot of uh, interesting guidance from the Supreme Court in the next couple of months uh, that could have some broad implications. So in Maynard, the issue is whether the government could conduct prolonged GPS surveillance without a warrant. And the question was, uh, was did Mr. Jones have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in his movements? And if he did, the government needed a warrant. If not, uh, the government was free to do it without a warrant. And what the government said was, prior case law established that there's no expectation of privacy on public thoroughfares. Uh, so police are free to manually follow you from point A to B without a warrant, so why shouldn't they be free to use uh, GPS to track a single trip? And if they could track a single trip, why couldn't they track every trip you did over the course of a month? It's no different, and therefore, uh, no warrants required. Now, what made this case into a big data case is that the Maynard court actually diverged from other courts uh, that had considered this issue. And what it noted is that aggregated data sometimes reveals a whole lot more uh, than the individual parts. So while Jones had a reasonable expectation, had no expectation of privacy in individual movements, uh, there was no expectation of being followed uh, for that long a period of time or being analyzed in that way. And so therefore, uh, there still was a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in the sum total of his movements, which is very much a big data concept because a lot of the point of big data is you take uh, more data than you and I can process and find new patterns uh, that wouldn't have otherwise been revealed. And so what's interesting here is that there may be reasonable expectations uh, of privacy that in a data set when A, the compilation is not reasonably expected. So the more these kinds of analyses happen with some frequency, it may uh, ultimately erode the REP. And it can't just be any kind of analysis. It has to be an analysis that reveals something specific to the individual. Uh, so something that reveals information about a larger community most likely wouldn't evoke an REP. Uh, but if individual people or information about individuals in that community uh, could be identified, uh, there's a risk. Now, from the Fourth Amendment, that only applies to government action. So really what we're talking about here is big data analysis by the government. However, if this analysis was conducted by a private actor, uh, while they wouldn't need any kind of warrant in order to do that because the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply, if the government then wanted to access that analysis, the Fourth Amendment would then apply again. Now, the government has filed what's called a petition for a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court earlier this year, uh, basically asking the highest court in the land uh, to review this opinion, because I think the government very clearly recognized there were a lot of bigger issues uh, at stake than the conviction of one drug runner. And I thought we'd close with three quotes uh, from the petition, just to sort of look at some of the big data issues uh, that might be addressed by the Supreme Court uh, in, in hopefully a few months' time. And the first is, should courts, for privacy purposes, consider uh, aggregated data to be somehow different uh, than individual points of data? So to the extent you know, big data uh, is a powerful tool, is that going to be recognized uh, by the privacy regime? And of course, it'll start in the constitutional privacy sense, but uh, based on this holding, there may be other implications to other uh, kinds of privacy regimes. The second interesting thing, I think, goes right to something that Alistair had mentioned earlier. Uh, what's the line between data and big data? Right? It's, a, it's a definitional issue. So to the extent uh, big data has a different risk profile uh, than data, and that we need to regulate it in some different way because of that power, uh, where do you draw the line? How much data needs to be aggregated before it becomes big data? Do you have to have different kinds of data sets? Does it have to all follow the same form? Uh, what are the rules here? So, uh, we may see the Supreme Court trying to understand uh, really at what point uh, does big data exist and become powerful as compared to just normal data which we've been dealing with for a long time.
And the final point is that often very big law, uh, very important law, comes from very small cases. Uh, so this is the case about one drug runner, but the potential here uh, is much larger. And what the government's realized is that while this case is about GPS surveillance and prolonged GPS surveillance, it has the potential to apply to any kind of analysis conducted by the government on any kind of public data. So what the government wants is the ability uh, to do big data analysis uh, based on its citizens without a warrant. So can it look on the internet, compile uh, all our various information, and use that for whatever purpose it wants uh, without a warrant, which is a very, very big, very important, and very scary issue uh, that's going to be potentially addressed with uh, in the context of this very small case. So that's my presentation. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can feel free to email me. And I'm happy to stick around now for some questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nolan. <clears throat> I'm always, stick around for a sec. Don't run yet. So I, every time I've worked with Nolan, I'm always like, wow, I knew so much less than I thought I did. Um, if I heard rightly, zip codes, forget that. And as Tim retweeted or tweeted recently, there goes demographic analysis, right? Um, rights to privacy and data resulting from analysis is a huge issue. Uh, this, so the, the Supreme Court's going to rule on this soon? The, the Maynard case, it hasn't been heard yet. It's in briefing right now. But in the upcoming session, uh, it'll be dealt with. So within a year from now. Because that sounds like it has impacts for you know, a terrorist who says, you weren't allowed to analyze me, all the way to a private individual who says, that's not admissible. I mean, well, that, I mean, that's the issue, right? The government always says it's a security issue and always asks for the broadest possible powers. And so there needs to be uh, some line drawing. And I think you know, there's really two ways the court can go. The court can really um, can make a very narrow opinion and sort of pass the buck and put off dealing with the bigger issues. Uh, or we may see a very broad opinion. And the Supreme Court really does care about uh, freedom of speech and constitutional issues like this, and, and it really wouldn't be shocking to me if the court decided to go uh, the latter route and really have a very broad uh, foundational opinion here. It does seem like what you said about the use of data at frequency as that becomes more common, what looks like excessive search will soon be taken for granted. So it's almost like the more we use big data, the more the rights to privacy of the sum of data erode because it becomes normal. Well, I mean, we're all carrying around these smartphones now that are like massive sensors tracking all kinds of aspects of our life. Uh, we're publishing our life on, 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 the, on Facebook and Twitter and all the other places. So we're pumping out massive quantities of data. Uh, and so these are things that would have previously been private, but it's kind of hard to say uh, it's private now when you're pushing it out to the world. So the more we do this and the more we build services on top of this, uh, how courts analyze privacy issues is just going to naturally change because our expectations are going to change. Now, let's say Alistair's on Twitter and I happen to not be on Twitter. Um, so it's not that Alistair's REP is different than my REP. It's more of a societal issue. So as more people use it, even those of us who don't use certain functionality are, are going to be impacted by it. Well, awesome. Thank you, as always. Thank you very much. Great stuff. <laughs>